Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. This is going to be the commentary on Zechariah chapter 8. I'm going to try to finish up this series. So let's get started. Verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now, what is the Lord of hosts? Well, when you're talking about the host, um, we're not talking about Catholic theology where they're talking about a cracker. No. Uh, we're talking about a group. And if you're talking about in heaven, well, then you'd be talking about angels. At least in the Old Testament, uh, the host of heaven would have been exclusively the angels with the possible exception of Elijah and Enoch, the only two humans that never died. But uh, in the New Testament, after the resurrection, after the uh, Lord went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and preached unto the spirits in the prison, Abraham's bosom, anybody's interested, I've got a Bible study on that. All those were taken up into heaven to be with the Lord. And uh, in the those that are killed in the tribulation period uh, by the beast, well, they were, you read about, uh, they were under the altar. The souls of them that were beheaded were under the altar. And they were... Um, they cried with a loud voice, right? Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. What testimony? The testimony of Jesus. All right, so... Under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice. Who's crying with a loud voice? The souls of them that are under the altar that were slain for the word of God. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, there is no such thing as soul sleep. That is a false doctrine. And yes, I know there's a verse in the Bible that says that uh, the dead, they know nothing. Well, guess what? Maybe that's talking about they know nothing about what's going on on earth. That's how I look at it. Because the Bible clearly says that the, you know, these souls under the altar are crying with a loud voice. So, the Lord of hosts, uh, the host of heaven, the angels, and the souls of those that were throughout history, right? You ever heard of going to a restaurant and you have a host or a hostess and they seat you in the restaurant? Or you go to a, a party and the person sponsoring the party is called a host. It has reference to a group of people. So, all right, Zechariah 8, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Now, there reaches a point where the Lord gets angry, and he punishes his children, he spanks them, but then after a while, he gets jealous because the heathens are at ease. And uh, so now he's going to return them. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Now, let's take a look. Um, 
why the Lord did captivity for 70 years? Well, that's real simple. Well, let's take a look at a few verses. Now, Isaiah was uh, prior to the captivity. So, Zechariah is after the captivity. So, let's look at Isaiah 3 and verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. How about Micah? Micah is another book of the minor prophets. Uh, Micah 3 and verse 10. They build up Zion with blood. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Uh, that verse could apply today just as much as most any time in the history of Jerusalem. There were times Jerusalem was considered a holy city, but I don't know. Not today. Jeremiah 4.14 O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? How about Ezekiel 16.2? Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Malachi. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Revelation 11.8 Speaking of the two witnesses that confront the beast and the false prophet. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Now, what did God do to Sodom? He rained fire and brimstone on it. That's how much he loved Sodom. Oh yeah, God's a God of love. That's what they always tell us. Yep, God loved Sodom so much he rained fire and brimstone upon them. Uh, guess what? Um, Egypt's not very, uh, spoken of very kindly in the Bible either. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, all these people that are telling you that uh, Mystery Babylon is Rome, or Washington, D.C., or New York City, ask them, what is the name of your Lord? Because my Lord, who's named Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. My Lord was not crucified in Washington, D.C., District of Columbia, the goddess, Columbia, not in New York City, and not in Rome. And if they tell you, well, you know, the Romans crucified Jesus. No, no. The Jews had Jesus crucified. Rome carried out the sentence, but they didn't do it. Pilate tried to release Jesus three times. So, Jesus, my Lord, was crucified in Jerusalem, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And this is end-time Jerusalem, people. Now, let's talk about Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Matthew 23, 37. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Ah, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Ah. All right, so, Zechariah 8, verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, 
and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. Um, this is kind of foreshadowing the future, because there's going to be a new Jerusalem, people. It's going to happen one day. All right, so where do we read about New Jerusalem? Well, Revelation 3 and verse 12. Him that overcometh, we have to overcome, people. Uh, may the Lord give us strength to overcome. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Why New Jerusalem? Because the old one's polluted, people. Which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, as opposed to the unholy city, earthly Jerusalem, right? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's going to be beautiful. All right, let's go back. Uh, let's see. Zechariah 8, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountains of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Now, where do we read about mountains in the Bible? Let's take a look at that. All right, everybody, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Um, let's see, I could make this a long, long Bible study, but I, I don't think I'm going to. But... Um, Here's the thing. King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians, think Mystery Babylon, took Judah, Jerusalem, into captivity for the 70 years, right? Now, Daniel is going to, by the wisdom and spirit of the Lord, interpret a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that nobody else could. So let's take a look at it. And we'll, you know, there's a, there's some prophecy in, hit, in this. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And all his magicians and fortune tellers and uh, couldn't interpret it. Because, well... He said he wasn't even going to tell him what the dream was. He says he want, wanted them to tell him what the dream was so that he had proof that they could interpret it. I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, yeah, tell me what my dream was and then give me the interpretation. But they couldn't do it. So, so in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 19... So, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So, God revealed this secret thing unto Daniel in a night vision, right? Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Think about that, people. You know why Barack Obama and Trump were presidents? God put them there. Now, I've always, a uh, pastor that I really respect said, you know what? Wicked rulers are a reflection of the spiritual state of the people. Oh, yeah. So, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them 
that know understanding. When you seek God's wisdom with all your heart, he'll reveal things to you. These, these idiots that go to churches where the pastors lie to them constantly, that don't bother to read their Bible, but boy, they can sure tell you what, uh, what their sports team did last week and the stats of their favorite quarterback or their favorite baseball player or, uh, or uh, you know, what their favorite soap opera star's been doing. God's not going to show them much mercy, if, in my opinion. So, verse 22, He, the Lord, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with Him. I thank Thee and praise Thee, O Thou God of my fathers, who hath given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Now remember, Daniel was a prince in Judah. Verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had ordained, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. See, Nebuchadnezzar was going to have his soldiers kill the wise men of Babylon because they couldn't reveal to him the, the, the secret of his dream. Whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to, unto, uh, said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. What's the latter days? The end times, people. That's that's the latter days, the end times. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter, and he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king that thou mightest show that thou mightest show the thoughts of thy heart thou o king sawest and behold a great image this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible the brightness was uh, excellent but the form is terrible. I wonder if that's the uh, the angel of light. Don't we read about the angel of light in the Bible? Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also are transformed as the ministers of righteousness, 
whose end shall be according to their works. Oh, yeah. So, let's go back to Daniel 2. All right, Daniel 2 and verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before them, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Uh, first time brass is mentioned, it's um, in Genesis chapter 4, it has reference to Cain's descendants. And the same thing with iron. So, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Huh. So, iron, does that have reference to Cain and his descendants and the clay? Does that have reference to Adam and how he was formed out of the dust of the earth? I don't know. That's about the only way I could think of it. Verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone, a stone, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Now, how could a stone not not be cut out without hands. It's a heavenly stone, right? Which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. We're going to go into that. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. O thou, uh, thou, O king, art a king of kings. Well, he's a king of kings, but he's not the Lord of lords. That applies only to Christ, right? All right, so... Verse 37, it says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. See, the God of heaven gave him a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwelt, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom, oh, this is the bad one. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, forasmuch as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, now, the word men, if you look up the um, root word in the Hebrew, it's Adam. It's Adam. It's the same word as Adam. Uh, there, sometimes they would translate it as Adam. Other times they would translate that same word as men because it was Adam man. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." 
For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, uh, some people will they'll argue and say, well, you know, what was the silver, what was the brass, what was the iron and the clay? Well, the, the, um, the end time kingdom, the part, the toes of part iron and part clay, that's going to be, that's going to be the end time beast system. Most people think that the, uh, the silver kingdom, the, the arms and the chest was, uh, well, some people say Persia. Some people say it was Greece. I don't know. Um, and then there's other kingdoms. Some people say it was Rome. But you know what? The Ottoman Empire, the Muslims, um, that empire encompassed an area almost the same size as, about the same size as Rome and lasted for 500 and something years. And um, the, the remnant of that kingdom is uh, Turkey. So, I don't know. Do your own research. Figure out what you believe. Because I'm not sure. Alright, so let's take a look at some mountains. Alright, so remember where we read that a stone uh, cut out without hands would become a mountain? Well, in Micah, M-I-C-A-H, one of the minor prophets, uh, if you want to read it with me, you can take a look. It's just before the beginning of the New Testament. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. But in the last days, ah, prophecy here. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. Verse 2, and many nations, what nations? Israel, and many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. Right? So, this is kind of a figure of speech. The mountain, you know, Micah 4.1, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. So what is this rock that becomes a mountain that was cut out without hands? Well, Paul tells you in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. You know, this is why they want to get rid of Paul. This is why all these Paul deniers, uh, you know, <laughs> they're just, I don't know. Yeah, keep, keep listening to the Hebrew roots, sacred name people. Keep listening to rabbis that hate Jesus. Yeah, they're the ones that want to get rid of Paul. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. See, people, Christ is the rock. Period. And he's going to be the, the rock is going to turn into a mountain that covers the whole world, his government. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 31, for their rock is not our rock. And we're not talking about music here, people. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, 
a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Isaiah 8 and verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense. To both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare, a trap, right? For a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. We just read some of this from the Old Testament, but Peter repeats it. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's go back to Zechariah, chapter 8. All right, Zechariah 8. Uh, let's see, I guess we'll go to verse 3 again, since I went on a long rabbit trail there. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. Uh, why, are they, why are the old men carrying a staff? Well, that was uh, before they had canes. I guess they had a staff, right? Verse 5, And the street of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built." This earthly temple was just a shadow of the heavenly temple, which is going to be Christ one day. So, for behold, I'm sorry, for be, before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people, as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase. For the ground shall give her increase. In other words, the crops are going to grow. And the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. 
Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, As I thought to punish you, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. Now remember something, people. The Lord, when he repents, he's not repenting of evil. Uh, or sin, I should say. He's not repenting of sin. We have to repent of sin. I know there's famous Bible preachers that have uh, hundreds and thousands of views, a lot more than me, that'll tell you, oh, well, you know, repenting of sin, well, that's, you know, that's not necessary. Well, we have to repent of our sin and wickedness God doesn't repent of sin and wickedness. God may bring evil upon us for our sin and wickedness. But when the Lord repents, it's not the same as our repenting. But uh, these false teachers will try to make you think it means the same thing. It doesn't. As I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, so again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor, execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Ah, and love no false oath for all these things, for all these things are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Now, what we just read about, you know, uh, your neighbor, well, I know I've beat this to death, but uh, let's go to Matthew 22 and verse 36. Somebody asked Jesus, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Uh, when people tell you, well, you know, you need to be circumcised, and you need to keep the Sabbath, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, uh, love the Lord, love thy neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And hopefully you have enough sense to know that you're not to love the enemies of God if you have them as neighbors. Let me tell you something, people. There's a reason why the Christians in early America got rid of the Indians. They were heathens, satanic. They did human sacrifice, and they performed cannibalism. Yeah, they did. And when you live next door to cannibals, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Pass them a salt shaker or are you going to grab your rifle? Let's see, salt shaker or a rifle? Oh, wait, one of my kids just went missing and they're having a feast. You know, and, and, and they'll, the um, media, who, which is owned by a bunch of antichrists, uh, they'll tell you that... Uh, Oh, those white people, they're devils because they killed those poor Indians. They had good reason to, people. They had good reason to. You know, of course, they, they get rid of that. All right. Jer Zechariah 8, and verse 17. And let, none of your, uh, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath. Um... You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you could have somebody put to death in Old Testament times. Oh, yeah, I saw him murder somebody. You know, and you get a couple, two other people, one or two other people say the same thing. They would be put to death. There was no, well, you know, he's not guilty by reason of insanity or, uh, you know, uh, forensic evidence. No, no, it had to be two or three witnesses. And let me tell you something, people. If you got caught lying on an oath and you tried to have somebody put to death and you got caught lying about it, 
they put you to death. The, per the person that committed perjury would be put to death. You know what? Let me tell you something. That God's law works. People would think two and three times before they started lying on the stand. So, and love no false oath for all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness, and cheerful feasts. Therefore love the truth and peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass, that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitant of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, and many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men, ten men, why ten men? The ten tribes of northern Israel? That's what I think. And it shall come to pass that then men, now remember, Judah was, uh, uh, Jerusalem was inhabited by Jeru uh, Judah and Benjamin, part, a portion of Benjamin, and the Levites that were serving in the temple. So basically, it was the two tribes of Jerusalem, but the ten northern tribes of Israel, with which Ephraim was the main, the main tribe. And it shall come to pass, and in the, you know, I'm sorry, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take, uh, shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. Now, we're talking about true Judah here. We're not talking about Revelation 2.9. Look up Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9 if you don't know what I'm talking about. Even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. All right, that's the conclusion of Zechariah chapter 8. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In His precious name, amen.